I'm pleased to welcome Julia Flynn Seiler today. Uh, Ms. Seiler has reported extensively on the Mandavi Winery for the Wall Street Journal, and she continues to write for them on wine and business. Uh, her recently published book, The House of Mandavi, is a New York Times bestseller. It chronicles the family business from uh, its Italian immigrant founders to the split between their sons and finally to the financial trouble that caused them to lose the business. Uh, I'm now very pleased to welcome Julia Flynn Seiler. <laughs> oh, can you hear me? Hi, everybody. I'm so delighted to be here. I brought our sons. They can't believe that you guys get paid for working here. <laughs> Unbelievable pool table. You know, this is great. Video games. Um, I want to start. Who here has ever had a Mandavi wine? Everybody. Who's had a Charles Krug wine? Wow. You guys, is this the wine club? <laughs> OK. Well, I want to start by telling you a little bit about how I got into uh, this story. And I love wine, but I've got to admit, I'm kind of a $15 and under kind of girl. I've never been a huge uh, enophile. Um, and spent most of my life as a business reporter. And I was in London uh, through most of the 90s. Our two sons were born there, Cody and Andrew. Hi, Andrew. And, uh, and Charlie, my husband's here. And um, I got a call from my dad, uh, who uh, was an entrepreneur in San Francisco. And he said, Jules, which is what he used to call me. He said, Jules, I need you to come home. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, I really want you to come work in the family business. And I had spent all my life as a journalist. I had trained as a storyteller. I had gone to Columbia University. I had gotten an MBA so that I could really understand the language of business. Um, but uh, you know, I was also, I love my dad. And um, I decided to take some time out from journalism and join a family business. And we had a family business in San Francisco that had a few restaurants and some real estate. So we all came back from London. And I started work in our little family business uh, on Van Ness Avenue. And within a few months, I realized that this was probably the worst decision I'd ever made, certainly the worst career decision I'd ever made. But I really found myself in the midst of a, a, a terrible fight between my brother and my dad. And, um, and it resulted in the breakup of our business, of our family business. We had to bring in an outside uh, counselor, somebody from who'd been trained at Harvard Business School to help us work out our differences. And it was truly probably the worst experience I'd ever been through in my life. It was traumatic for my family. It was tough. Um, I left the family business when it was broken up and really wanted to go back to writing for the Wall Street Journal, which I did. And it's one of those kind of karmic twists of fate that probably the first, I think it was the first story I ended up doing was a story about another family business. And what happened was I was having lunch with um, the deputy bureau chief of the Wall Street Journal in San Francisco. And he said, wow, did you see that story in the San Francisco Chronicle about Michael Mandavi? Michael's the son of Robert Mandavi. And he had been chairman of the Robert Mandavi Corporation. And he was, he was leaving as chairman. And it was puzzling to us why that would have happened. It's a family control company. So I called over to Oakville. How many people have visited the Robert Mandavi Winery? Almost everybody. It's beautiful. It's the most visited winery in Napa Valley, probably in California. And I, I, I don't know if this is apocryphal or not, but it's said that more people visit Napa Valley than visit Disneyland every year. It's a lot of people. Um, so I called over to the winery and I said, could, you know, could I talk to Michael? Could I talk to somebody at the company? Could I talk to the board of directors? And they said, no, no. And um, we're not talking to you at all. And uh, we, you know, any case, that for any reporter worth his or her salt is a red flag that makes you really curious. And so I spent the next, uh, next three months, three or four months, digging around, talking to anybody who would talk to me. Um, going through as many documents as I possibly could, spending a lot of time up in Napa Valley. And this was the result. Um, there's a front page story about uh, the Robert Mondavi Corporation and what was happening. But it was a very unusual front page story. 
I had started out thinking I was going to be writing a business story, but really what I was writing was a family story. And the stories chronicled a recurring pattern of brother against brother, which was very startling. Uh, people in Napa Valley, which is a pretty closed, very tight community, they knew this story. And they had, they had seen it firsthand. But people outside of that community really didn't know about that. And as a publicly traded company, the fact that um, the brothers, the current set of brothers, Michael Mandavi, who had stepped out as chairman, and his brother Timothy, who was on paper vice chairman, the fact that their squabbling had led to paralysis in the boardroom was news. Moreover, it was news that uh, the company was really on the verge of a, a breakup or a sale at that point. So this story caused a huge uproar in Napa Valley. And um, I also got a flood of emails. One of the emails I got was from a man named Bill Schinker. And I didn't even open it for a couple days. I'd never heard of him before. Finally opened it, and he said, what an amazing story. Uh, would you be interested in writing a book about this? Well, it turned out that Bill Schenker was the publisher of Barbarians of the Gate, which you all, I don't know if you are familiar with this. This is a classic uh, narrative piece of business journalism about a Wall Street takeover. And um, now the, the, the dilemma that I faced at that point was whether to pursue this story and enlarge it into a book. And I had a problem. And the problem was that Michael Mandavi, who's there, and Timothy Mandavi, who's right there, the two brothers, they weren't talking to me. Their father, Robert, wasn't talking to me. In fact, nobody in the inner circle was talking to me. How could I possibly turn this into a book? Um, as a reporter, that's a really troublesome question. So the story came out about a few days before the Napa Valley Wine Auction, which is one of the most uh, spectacular events in the wine world. It's where they, the Napa Valley Vintners put their wines up for auction to raise money for nonprofits. And it's a wonderful intersection between uh, Silicon Valley, um, these you know, artisans of the grapes, um, and society. It's a huge society event, and it, it costs thousands of dollars to even walk into the tent to be permitted to bid. <coughs> Uh, so I, I went to this, and that was really the first time I met the family. As I uh, watched the drama unfold before me, and when a vintner puts up their uh, their auction lot, it's really symbolic of their status, of how the wider wine world holds them in regard or in disregard. And so, as it turned out, I set the beginning of my book at that very moment, at the Napa Valley Wine Auction in June of 2004, about two, two days or so after this story had run. And unbeknownst to me, I had a hint of it, but I really didn't realize that at that moment, um, when the auction was taking place, their empire was starting to crumble. They were in in a crisis, a, a serious family crisis. I'm going to jump ahead to a picture from the Napa Valley Wine Auction, if I can get there. I don't know if I can get there. I got that. I should have done this before. OK, here we go. Yep, there we go. So I'm going to read a very short portion, a scene from that auction, um, to give you a little flavor from the book and also to uh, to set the scene of, of what it was like. Because I felt a bit like an anthropologist walking into this world of money, power, and really the, the royal family of the Napa Valley, who are the, the Mandavis. OK. The chief character is a Robert Mandavi, who is in his 90s. And uh, he founded the Robert Mandavi Winery and his wife, Margaret, who was then in her late 70s. Robert limped into the white tent, leaning heavily on his cane as his wife, Margaret, gently guided him to his seat at the front. He was still an icon, but in the past year had come to seem physically smaller than he had been before, shrunken in his stylish clothes. The hearing aid in his left ear could not pierce the cocoon of deafness that surrounded him 
and his once famous charisma had diminished. His mind had begun to slow in a way that alarmed some family members as he was beset by a fog of mental confusion that seemed to be thickening each day. More worrisome, Robert seemed to have lost some of the optimistic spirit that had buoyed him for so many decades. Anticipating that her husband would tire easily after recent surgeries, Margaret stayed by his side. With her ageless blonde effervescence, she offered friends a smile and a cheek to kiss as the couple waited for the bidding to begin. In her late 70s, she was a striking woman who carried her small frame with grace. She wore a drawstring linen pantsuit in the color of the Spanish moss that draped the valley's oaks. Although she had lived in Napa Valley for more than four decades, her English remained softly accented by her childhood in Switzerland. Auctioneer Fritz Hatton started the day's bidding. Fasten your seat belts because here we go, whooped Hatton, shuffling sideways across the podium. With his gourmand's belly spilling out of his trousers and his hands sweeping rapidly back and forth as if he were playing arpeggios, Hatton kicked up his heels with a flourish. Below him, a group of vintners also took flamboyant measures to ramp up the excitement. Wearing a Hawaiian shirt and Birkenstock sandals, Roger Trinquero, whose family Sutter Home Winery first became famous for its easy-to-drink blush Zinfandel, whipped out a squirt gun in one hand and a can of silly string in the other. He incited bursts of laughter at his table as he began spraying guests. The air inside the white tent grew warm. Then, minutes into the auction, some 2,000 wine lovers shifted their attention to the podium as Hatton started the bidding for lot 11. Lot 11 is the Mandavi's lot. 5,000, there it is, 10,000. An awkward silence followed. The bidding had stalled and hushed tension gripped the crowd. After decades of serving as a global ambassador for Napa Valley wines, promoting them in countless tastings and events, Robert Mondavi had built up deep reservoirs of goodwill. No one wanted to see the old king humbled by a low sale price for his family's choicest wines. Yet the most sophisticated wine buyers were no longer paying top dollar for Robert Mondavi Cabernets. The Mondavi reputation had slid a few years earlier after his younger son Timothy's winemaking style came under fire from such influential critics as Robert Parker and wine spectators James Lauby. By the late 1990s, wine connoisseurs had moved on to small production cult wines, such as Screaming Eagle, Harlan Estate, and De La Vale Vineyards, that were wildly expensive. $200 a bottle was not unusual and very hard to get. 15,000, 20, volunteers with big foam index fingers, the type that fans wave around at football games, pointed in the direction of bidders to draw Hatton's attention to rival paddles. Paddle 253, held by Just Jackson, the 74-year-old proprietor of Kendall Jackson Wine Estates, was bidding against Paddle 5, held by construction heir Ron Kuhn, a sharp negotiator who had had a legal run-in with the Mandavi family a few years earlier. Jackson wore a placidly earnest look on his face. With a net worth estimated by Forbes magazine at $1.8 billion, he was one of the wine industry's few billionaires. 45000 55000 Hatton looked around for any bidders to top the previous bid. There were none. Robert seemed confused by the slowing bids. Shadows crossed his face. Would his family suffer further dishonor by such a low price? Sold! To Jess and Barbara Jackson, thank you very much, exulted Hatton. Excited volunteers, known as the Hoopla Committee, surrounded Jackson, a towering man with a silver crown of hair. Some of them tossed up fluorescent green Napa Valley donor dollars, with each bill in the denomination of $50 million, bearing the slogan, In Wine We Trust. Across the room, Robert Mondavi's bald dome and aquiline profile was unwavering amid the flutter of the play money. And I'll stop there, but I'll, I will say that the, uh, the, the prologue goes on to, to describe a lot that's placed very closely to the Mandavi lot, and that's the Screaming Eagle lot. And it went for $220,000, more than four times as much as the Mandavi lot. Um, and it was just, you, you couldn't ignore the, the way that the wine world had changed 
very dramatically in the past few years. So uh, let me go back now. So in any case, um, I faced, I still faced the, I was decided to do a book. I faced the issue, how am I going to write a book when nobody's going to talk to me? Well, the first thing I did, of course, was go to Italy. So I headed off to the little village of Sassoferrato, where the Madavis had come at the turn of the century. Cesare and Rosa, his bride Rosa, they'd passed through Ellis Island. They made their way to the Central Valley. That's a picture of the St. Helena parade, probably in the 1920s, something like that. And they bought a winery called Charles Krug. Has anybody been to Charles Krug Winery? It's a beautiful, beautiful old winery. It, I think it may be the oldest in the valley. It dates back to around the time of the Civil War. But when the Mandavis bought it in the late 30s, it was a ghost winery. It had dirt floors. It wasn't producing wine anymore. Uh, it was in terrible condition. And they worked very hard and got it going. And, um, and started producing really wonderful wines. And the Mandavi brothers, Peter and, and his older brother Robert, became well known for their Traminer, which was a shortening of Gerwutz Traminer. I'm probably mispronouncing that name, but a very nice, light, airy uh, white wine. And they also introduced some great ideas like uh, wine tasting parties. Now, everybody here is familiar with those, but in the 50s, that was kind of a novelty. So they were real innovators in terms of the marketing of wine. Um, they started to uh, uh, have kids of their own. Robert had uh, three children, Michael, his oldest son, Marcy, his daughter, and Timothy, his youngest. Um, and Peter had uh, two sons as well. Now, Robert is a complex character. By the end of this project, I spent three years learning about the Mandavi family. I did more than 500 hours of interviews. I talked to more than 250 people. With, I, had, I worked with three researchers along the way, went through tens of thousands of pages of documents. And one of the most astonishing and really heart-wrenching discoveries that I made in the course of this book was what happened that led up to one of the most famous court cases in California wine history, really California corporate history, which was Mondavi versus Mondavi. And it began one autumn day in 1965. The brothers, Peter and Robert, were in Lodi. They were at a family gathering. Robert, a few years earlier, had bought a mink coat for his wife, Marjorie, because he had been invited to the White House to dine with Jackie Kennedy and Jack. And he wanted his wife to look beautiful, of course. Well, he didn't have enough money to pay for it, so he put it on his expense account. And um, Peter was upset, the younger brother who didn't get the invitation. He brought it up years later and, and, and basically accused his older brother of having stolen money from the company. And Robert said, take that back. And Peter wouldn't take it back. And so Robert hit him once. And then he hit him twice. And by one account, these two brothers, both in their 50s, end up rolling around in the dust. Robert throttles Peter. And when Mama Rosa, five feet tall, almost as wide as she is high, sees the marks on her youngest child's neck, her, the youngest child, Peter, his nickname is Babe, and he was the baby of the family, she is outraged. She, it brings up all those feelings over the years about Robert not paying due respect to her baby. She banishes him from the family business. He goes about five miles down Highway 29 and starts the Robert Mondavi Winery in 1966. He did get some help from the family, but it very, very quickly became clear that he was setting himself up in competition with the family business. He tried to distinguish himself, what he was doing, as being somewhat different. He started calling himself Mandavi, and the family had been calling themselves Mondavis. That wasn't enough. The family got very, very concerned. It erupted in a lawsuit in 1976. Uh, Rosa died in the midst of this lawsuit. Um, very, very sad, and the judge ultimately fully vindicated Robert, decided he was not a man of greed, and it was a stunning indictment of the rest of the family, which really had tried to cheat Robert out of his inheritance. And one of the things my researchers and I found in those tens of pages of court, thousands of pages of court documents, were, was a letter from a psychiatrist that really echoes um, 
the emotional harm that occurred to Robert's sister as a result of this very long, very, very bitter lawsuit uh, and law case. So fresh start, Robert Mondavi Winery. These are some pictures from the early days. That's the uh, blessing of the grapes, which to this day is still a tradition in the Napa Valley, uh, where a priest will come and bless the grapes. This is a picture for a few year, years later, it really captures the spirit of the boutique wine movement. Remember, at that time, the early 70s, a lot of people didn't want to live in the cities anymore. Um, they were looking for a fresh start of them, some sort. And then there was tremendous joie de vivre in Napa Valley in particular. And they were trying techniques that they had borrowed from the great French winemakers uh, and, and winemakers in Italy as well. Um, and the, Na the Robert Mondavi Winery became known as Mondavi University, producing some of the most famous winemakers who then went on to other places. That's Mike Gergich. Has anyone had a Gergich Hills? Beautiful, beautiful wines. That's Warren Winiarski in the red shirt. Warren was the very first winemaker at the Robert Mondavi Winery. In fact, one of the first people I went to talk to in the course of reporting this book was Warren, who had uh, been a University of Chicago lecturer before he became a winemaker. And to this day, he goes back every summer to uh, St. John's College and teaches Shakespeare. And so I sat down with Warren. I said, Warren, are there any models from literature which might be helpful in understanding brother versus brother and what happened at the Mondavi Winery? And we spent a great deal, talking, a deal of time talking about King Lear. King Lear, of course, is the Shakespeare play based on an aging king who attempts to divide his kingdom between his children. And war erupts. The most famous scene in King Lear is when King Lear has gone mad in the storm scene. And there was a lot of resonance which, with the drama that was at that moment unfolding at the Robert Mondavi Winery with his sons and his daughter. One of the early currents uh, in the history of what happened was the difficulty of being the son of a charismatic, visionary, and very passionate father. Here's a picture of Michael Mandavi. He's very young then. He's probably in his uh, 20s somewhere. And his dad is standing like that. Michael uh, was often in his dad's sh um, shadow. And that was a tough place to be, a very tough place to be. At the same time, a woman came into Robert's life. Uh, she had first work, worked at Charles Krug. She had then gone over to the Robert Mondavi Winery. Um, they had a love affair. And uh, she worked there. She was an employee. Um, and his wife and the mother of his three children also often worked at the winery. It left a lot of pain in that family. And to this day, there's still a lot of anger um, towards Margaret. Uh, although that said, Margaret was born in Switzerland, speaks many languages. And uh, somebody once said to me that you know, without Margaret, Robert would have been a boy from Lodi all his life. She brought a level of sophistication um, to the winery that wouldn't have been there without her. She contributed a great deal. But again, uh, that, that relationship uh, caused a lot of pain to his children. Robert Mondavi Winery is also famous for being the first American winery to ever enter into a joint venture with the French Grand Cru producer, in this case, the, uh, the uh, uh, Baroness, Baron Philippe de Rothschild. And that's a picture of the Baron in bed, where he preferred to do business. Sounds pretty good to me. Um, and right next to him is the label designer from Opus One. And she spent a month trying to find the right label uh, that both men, Robert Madavi and the uh, Baron, would like, and finally came up with a, a wonderful label. Opus One itself, when it was built, was the most expensive winery ever built in the Napa Valley. It was built by the same, or designed by the same architects that designed these Transamerica Pyramid. And at the time, people made fun of that design. They said it looked like a spaceship that had landed in the Napa Valley. And in truth, you know, it really was different from the, um, from the, the kind of uh, Victorian structures, uh, the big stone Gothic structures, which were much more common, are more common in the valley. 
Um, so it's a very, very unusual building there. It's right across from the Robert Mondavi Winery. Has anybody been to Opus One or tried an Opus One? Do you like the wines? Yeah, they're delicious. They're about $160, $170 a bottle. <laughs> So Robert, like his own father, very much wanted his sons to be part of the business. Um, and they tried a variety of power sharing arrangements over the years, co-CEOs, co-managing directors, office of the managing director, very different people. Timothy, the, the artist, the winemaker, Michael, very charismatic salesperson, very much the extrovert. They created a triangle that even though they had psychiatrists and family consultants come in and try to help them work out some of the conflicts that they felt um, really couldn't work them out. And they started to, those conflicts became even more acute in the early 90s when many, many Napa vineyards were attacked by a tiny little aphid called phylloxera that sucks all the juices out of grapevines. The Mandavis had to <coughs> replant many, many of their vineyards and they had a, a, big, a big bill to pay. And the banks were tightening lending. They decided to go to the public markets and do an IPO to pay for that replanting. And they studied companies such as the Washington Post Company um, and other family controlled publicly traded entities uh, and came up with a dual class shareholder structure that they were convinced was going to be takeover proof. Meanwhile, they kept on having a lot of great parties. This is one of my favorite. I love this picture. It's an out in Africa party that, that they hosted around that time. Uh, they're they're uh, giving the champagne, the, uh, the elephant uh, sparkling wine or champagne. And they brought in a bunch of uh, uh, African uh, animals, including chimpanzees, which were not potty trained. They ended up having to put diapers on them for the party so they wouldn't poop on anybody. Um, but the Robert Mondavi Winery, even after the IPO, became famous for really spectacular parties. Meanwhile, Robert, uh, Robert his grandchildren are starting to join the business and showing entrepreneurial energy of their own. That's Carlo, that's Tim's son, that's Rob, that's Michael's son. And they, uh, they very much want to join the business. And Robert himself is very hopeful of creating a, a business dynasty. In other words, a business that can be handed from generation uh, to generation. This is the Napa Valley Wine Auction again in uh, 2004. And I'm not going to tell you what happens um, uh, afterwards. But I will say that as part of becoming a public company, they started to recruit uh, pretty tough, pretty smart outside directors who started to question some of those parties, question some of the, the, the line between what belongs to the family, what belongs to the company. Uh, chief among them was a, uh, a man named Sir Anthony Greener. And uh, he became the leader in a group of outside directors that questioned the family's leadership of the Robert Mondavi Winery. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the country, another pair of brothers, Richard and Robert Sands, uh, they started their wine dynasty on the opposite end. They, they are best known probably for Richard's Wild Irish Rose. I bet you nobody in this room has ever tried that stuff. OK, it costs less than $2. Uh, when I was in the war room at Constellation in New York, they had just tried out a new variety. It was fluorescent green, the green apple kind. This is this kind of uh, gutter wine, basically. I, and no, no disrespect intended, a good seller. Uh, but they are watching what's going on, and they're particularly watching this drama unfold with the outside directors, the brothers fighting each other, the, the, the Robert himself very upset with the direction the company is taking. In any case, I will uh, leave some of the surprises. How did those brothers end up taking over a seemingly takeover-proof company? Um, that's what I wanted to know as a reporter, and I was able eventually to convince enough people to talk to me to put together the pieces of this puzzle. This is, these are pictures from the year later after the, the Napa Valley's royal family was deposed, essentially. And there was a, um, and this is the 2005 Napa Valley wine auction, where there was a joint lot, um, a, a joint barrel of wine produced by both 
sides of the warring family, Peter's side and Robert's side. And they really went for decades without talking to each other. So it was kind of a publicity stunt, but it was also kind of true. And uh, meanwhile, the other, well, Robert and Tim, Marcy, <coughs> Margaret, are also planning to produce some wine on their own. Who's missing from this picture? Well, Michael's missing. Um, there is a continuing rift in the family, and it has to do with what happened, the events that unfolded in 2004, which were extremely painful. But in any case, I'd love to take some questions, and uh, anything about wine, anything? Uh, please, don't be shy. Anybody tried any Screaming Eagle? Thank you. So it looks like you had a lot of fun writing this book. Yes. I just want to say, it sounds like you had a lot of fun writing this book, and I wanted to know what the most fun part was for you. What personally. a great question. I had a lot of fun. What was the most fun part? Well, I, I joked to my colleagues at the Wall Street Journal, because I continued to do stories for the paper during this period, that I was on a hardship duty having to drive to Napa Valley at least once a week and try amazing wines and talk to a lot of the most famous winemakers in the world. So that was fun, but I think the thing I really enjoyed most was meeting some of the people in the wine industry. Warren Winiarski is a fascinating, fascinating person. Um, I, met, uh, I met Piero Antonori, whose family traces its roots back 700 years. Uh, it's a noble Italian family that has produced winemaking or wines for, you know, since Renaissance times. So I think the people I met, I really, really enjoyed that. So, yes. So at the beginning when you were trying to do your research, you had trouble getting close to anybody who actually knew real stories about what was going on. How did the events transpose that you ended up getting to actually speak to the primary characters of the story? That is a great question. How did I crack the fortress around Sorry. the Mandavi family? Um, it had to do with finally after the takeover had occurred, after it looked like the shareholder lawsuits, which were almost immediately filed um, in the wake of that, looked like they were not going to be serious, the outside chairman of the board who had replaced Michael um, decided that it was a good idea to talk to me. And primarily, this is a man named Ted Hall who runs, he's a former McKinsey consultant. He has a ranch, an organic ranch up in Napa called Long Meadow Ranch raises cattle, produces wine. Um, and he had been cast as the villain. The people closest to the Mandavis really had spread the word that, that Ted was the bad guy in what happened. And I, I don't know what went through Ted's mind, but I, I believe that he wanted to, in his mind, set the record straight. And he knew I was doing this book. And he, he granted me a, a series of very lengthy interviews. And once it became clear, particularly to Michael and Tim Mandavi, that Ted had shared a lot with me, and that I knew the basic outlines of the story, then they decided, too, that they, they were better off sharing their perspective. So that's how it happened. Um, and I went back again and again to these principal players and um, would fact check with them. And if I learned something new, I'd go back and say, well, you know, what's your perspective on this? One of the, the great surprises was that Robert Mandavi contributed um, in a, a very surprising way to the downfall of, of, of the family's control of the company. And so that was something I, I really wanted to get exactly right and uh, went back again and again to the key players in the drama to talk to them about. So at the beginning, you said that you who were out in San Francisco and watched the uh, disintegration of your own family's business. Yes. So a two-part question. One, are you willing to share some details of that? And two, were there any similarities between your own family uh, you know, struggles and the Mandavi family's struggle? Yes. Thank you for that question. Um, it, much smaller family business. It didn't disintegrate. It did break up. My dad ended up running one half of it. My brother ended up running the other half. Almost, uh, the similarity that I see was that problems arose almost out of success. And as the success grew greater, questions started rising to the surface of who gets credit for it. Is it dad? Is it 
brother. The same thing happened to the Mandavis. Um, they went public. All of a sudden, they have access to capital. Um, it's almost, there was a lot of success and a lot of energy and a lot of different projects. And Dad, Robert Mandavi in particular, had trouble really stepping away and letting Michael run the show. And he grew, Robert Mandavi grew very concerned about the direction Michael was taking the company. Likewise, my dad, I guess, you know, if you were a psychologist or a family business consultant might say that both men experienced a little bit of founder syndrome, which is uh, the difficulty of letting go. It's your baby, you created the company. It's hard to let your son take, take it over. So I think that's the similarity. Did the fact that you had just been through that affect your writing? I mean, yes, I think that it um, helped me to be more empathetic towards everyone. I mean, I really, I, I, I had experienced a lot of pain in what happened with our family. So I found my role in talking to particularly Michael and Timothy to be one of a listener. And I interviewed them shortly after they had lost control of the Robert Mondavi Corporation. And it was a very, very painful time for them. And I, I don't know if they appreciated my listening, but um, I, I, they did give me a lot of their time, which I appreciated. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure this is, this is part of your research, but could you tell us a little bit about how Fume Blanc was born? Yes, that's a great question, how Fume Blanc was born. Robert Mondavi really was, he had gone to, to France in the early 60s and learned, soaked up as much as he could from French winemakers and how they did, how they did what they did, both on a technical terms in terms of oak barrel fermentation, as well as marketing. And in France, there's something called, I think it's called a Blanc, Blanc Fumé. And in the United States in the early 60s, Sauvignon Blancs, which is exactly the same thing as a Fumé Blanc, were widely considered to be fairly poor wines. They tend to be sweet. The grapes that were used at that time were not very good. Um, it was a liability to try to sell a Sauvignon Blanc as a better than average wine. And so he came, it was really a stroke of genius. He said, okay, we're going to add a little French panache to this. We're going to reverse the name. We're going to call it Fumé Blanc, which is white smoke. And um, we're going to not be entirely clear that, that this actually is a Sauvignon Blanc. We're going to market it as something um, a little bit better than that. And in my opinion, their Fumé Blancs to this day are absolutely delicious. I like them. So, Any other questions? Hi, thanks for coming to talk to us today. Oh, I'm um, delighted, thank so you. So these people who control Napa Valley, did you get any sense, are they, were they just there at the right time or do they have a special talent for wine or for business or for both? Well, let me speak, I know the Mandavi family best, um, so let me speak to that. Cesare Mandavi, he's the man who was the, came from Italy and settled in the Central Valley and he began his business here as a a grape broker, a grape wholesaler. He knew that the best grapes in the state of California came from Napa Valley. And that's why when a winery came up for sale, a ghost winery, a derelict winery, he knew it would be a good idea. That would be a great place to move um, a little bit higher up in the, in the production chain and, and open a winery, start a winery. Um, and their experience, the family's experience, then in the 30s was really, again, as bulk winemakers. They had done a little bulk winemaking in the Central Valley, not high quality stuff. In fact, most of what came out of Napa Valley in the 30s, the 40s, even the 50s, could still be considered tank wines. And those were bulk wines sent across the country in railroad cars. And they often were oxidized. They were extremely poor quality. Um, and it was only in the 60s when 
Uh, Napa in particular, in part because of the Mandavis, but in part because of a very smart group of dedicated winemakers, Andrei Chelichov was one of them, um, who came from Europe, started to, they formed a technical committee and they started swapping stories about how do we prevent oxidation? What can we do? I mean, in those days, they used to ferment uh, wine in open barrel redwood tanks. Now, yellow jackets would fall into that wine, gunk would fall into it, nasty really nasty stuff. And so they started to change the way they made it. And I think the fact that they got together, I'm sure there's a parallel in the computer industry, uh, swapping ideas about how to make it better. And I'm not sure there was the same kind of technical cooperation going on in the Central Valley, which stayed more committed to uh, the bulk wine market. Although UC Davis, of course, even in the 50s was, was the center of American uh, research into winemaking. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. OK. What has the feedback been on the book? Have you been in contact with the Mandavi family and or kind of Napa Valley's feeling in general? Well, one, one of the, the um, funniest phone calls I got was shortly after the book came out. It was from Rob Mandavi, Michael's son who's in his 30s, very high energy uh, fellow who has now gone to work with Michael at a new company, their new family company called Folio. And Rob called me from his cell phone and he said, you know, kind of the, the scratchy cell phone and he said, you know, I think I'm the only member of the family who wants you to sign and send me five copies of the book. <laughs> And likewise, I had another, I had a lady who is the PR person for the Peter Mandavi side of the family come to my reading in Sonoma. And before the reading, she said something to me along the lines of, thank you for being so nice to Peter, <laughs> which I thought was humorous because that the, the court documents in the Mandavi versus Mandavi case did not reflect well on Peter Mandavi Sr., unfortunately. That just was the case. That, that's what happened. Um, but uh, I, I did have a book signing scheduled at the local bookstore in Napa, which was canceled. Um, and uh, after the New York Times chief wine writer, Eric Asimov, wrote a wonderful piece about the book very shortly after it came out. And as soon as that piece came out, I, my inbox was again flooded with invitations from Napa. So I, I think that um, people in Napa realized that that's what happened. I, I'm just the chronicler. I was the person who told the story. And um, I would imagine, I mean, it's a tough emotional story. And, uh, you know, they have not told me directly what they think. I imagine it's, you know, it probably has dug up some painful memories. Oh. Yes? Did you find yourself liking or disliking any of the characters? And, or were you able to keep objective throughout the whole? I, I found, um, I like them all. I particularly became fascinated with Robert Mandavi as a person. And what kind of, I mean, what kind of person is it who would sue his mother who's in her 70s and barely literate? Really, that takes a lot of backbone, a lot of guts, a lot of strength. Um, it, uh, yeah. I, I became fascinated with that. And, and with him. And he was, uh, he is, he's still alive. He's 94 years old now. Um, passionate, a visionary, and his, he says himself in his autobiography that he was not a particularly good parent. And my reporting showed that too. So very complex uh, person. And I found it just fascinating to learn about him. Yes. So now that the Mandavi wine business has been split up twice in each of two generations, do you think that they've learned anything that's going to prevent the third generation from repeating their mistakes? That's a great question. Uh, um, it's eerie the way brother, brother versus brother pattern kept repeating itself. Very strange. I know that Michael Mandavi is trying to break those patterns with his new family business. His business card says founder coach. And he sees himself as a coach to his kids, Dina and Rob. And 
says that he's pushed the decision making almost entirely to them. He doesn't intervene, he lets them do it. Um, and you know, you can only hope so. Uh, it's pretty hard to break patterns. I think we all find that personally. I certainly do. So I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if this ends up as a Harvard, you know, Harvard Business School did five case studies on the Robert Mondavi Corporation. And this, I, I, I was up in Napa two weekends ago and a, uh, a neighbor of the Mondavis who owns a winery um, was at a party that I was at with his wife. And they said, hey, Julie. And I said, hi, how are you? And they said, we're reading your book. In fact, we have, um, we're doing a book group with our two children, our two adult children who are in the family business. And we're gonna do a discussion around it. We're gonna use it as a case study. And I thought that was really interesting, really interesting. And so I've been getting some feedback of what people are drawing the, as the lessons. I don't lay out the lessons, that's not my job. My job was just to lay out the, the story and what happened. Um, sort of follow up on, on the earlier question about timing. Uh, what you're calling a ghost winery, was that really uh, an after effect of prohibition? Because prohibition really sort of decimated what was a, a burgeoning industry at, at that time. And I was wondering if that's essentially how they got their start. Um, I hope I understand you're correct. Are you asking whether ghost winery is the right uh, term, or are you saying is this a, a link to prohibition and what happened? Was it linked to prohibition? Yes, yes, very much, and I'm sorry, I should have said that. Prohibition wiped out most of the American winemaking industry, and there had been a lot of wineries in Napa Valley, and most of them shut down. And uh, you know, they were only allowed to make um, wine for religious pur purposes. One of the ones that shut down was Charles Krug, eventually. So I also, oh yes. So what was the best wine you got to taste in, in, in researching this? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question. Um, I know Screaming Eagle, Screaming Eagle was the most expensive wine that I got a tiny taste of. It's very delicious. But I have to say that my very favorite wine that I tasted in the course of all the research I did was um, a ridge wine produced right around here, up, up in the hills, which was delicious. And in fact, they recreated the famous Judgment of Ter Paris tasting a year or two ago. And I think the ridge wine came in first uh, for modern, a modern matchup between California versus France. And I loved that wine. I thought it was really, really good. But I do want to say, anybody who has a book, anybody here have a book group? Wine lovers, book groups? Well. There is, an, uh, there is something fun that's on my website, um, and it is a, a sipping tasting notes. So I don't know about, I have a book group, and we drink a lot of wine in my book groups. And I've made a suggestion about how to um, uh, pair wines with the reading of this book. And so you can drink Mike Gergich's wine, <laughs> you can drink Warren Winiarski's wine, you can even drink, uh, you know, if you have a, you're on a budget, Go to, go to Trader Joe's and get some uh, Two Buck Chuck, because there's a lot about uh, uh, Fred Franzia, the maker of Two Buck Chuck, in this book as well. But thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this. I'm happy to sign books, too.